Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode I decided to introduce my large hydrogen oxygen rocket, which I mentioned previously, and is meant to sort of pave the way towards nuclear thermal rockets, though that's further down the road. The main reason I wanted to introduce it is because it's going to make refueling things in high orbit easier, of course, and um, it was actually initially designed with an eye towards refueling the Shinkansen space plane, which I will also eventually introduce in this series. The Shinkansen space plane was designed to be refueled by either SLS or um, space, uh, the uh, Starship from SpaceX. So uh, I didn't really want to use SLS in this series, <laughs> and I didn't want, I don't even know what Starship is going to end up looking like yet, and uh, don't know what its numbers are going to be. So I decided we would make our own little rocket to do the refueling instead and it would also help with the stuff I plan to do later on. And when you think about it, uh, when we want to drill for fuel, you know, convert uh, water and the atmosphere into fuel on Mars, it's actually easier to get just the water and turn it to hydrogen and oxygen than to then combine it with the CO2 to make methane and the hydrogen-oxygen mix is more efficient. The question is about storing the hydrogen, right? Uh, limiting boil-off. And actually, we could just use extra power. If we're going to have the power to, you know, do the water splitting in the first place, um, we could just split the water closer to the time that we need it, and then it'll be ready to go. And if we have the power, we could probably chill the stuff relatively well and reliquify the hydrogen gas. So I think that's probably the way to go, and I'll work on systems like that. But first, the rocket. Now, uh, so I needed something about the size of SLS's payload or Starship's payload to lower orbit on one go, and so we're talking about 105 tons or more. And um, you can see the NASA logo, right? The Worm logo. I had previously created this texture for procedural tanks. Uh, just for the heck of it, I think I made a video on how to make procedural tank textures and made this particular texture in that series in that video and Yeah, I decided to make use of it and the reason is well when you think about it the original rocket the Sagita series The size of the tank was based on our ability to transport it and so the diameter of the tank was basically the same as Falcon 9 or the boosters for the space shuttle for the same reason because that's the diameter that you can transport by truck and train. And so I had to come up with a logic for what diameter this would be, uh, what would make sense. And there was three options. The equipment at Cape Canaveral has a max size of 12 meters, and that was the region, original reason why uh, Elon Musk picked, uh, picked uh, 12 meters for the diameter of the ITS and before he downscaled it to 9 meters. Um, there is, of course, 10.1 meters, which was the upper stage of the, Sat or the second stage of Saturn V. And that's a reasonable option. We have knowledge of how those tanks work. And then, of course, 8.4 meters, which is the diameter of the shuttle's external tank and SLS, and before it, Ares. And I mentioned Ares, Ares V in particular, for a reason, <laughs> uh, because uh, the rocket I came up with is ultimately sort of like an Ares V, with with major differences. I've called it Kasei, which is actually Japanese for Mars, for because of Ares, because Ares, of course, is the Roman uh, name for Mars after the god, and so same idea. Um, so we have an 8.4 meter tank, but. Things are a little bit different. Of course, I create my own custom engines. And when we go down, you can see that the boosters are actually the Sagita rocket stages, right? For our heavy and super heavy, we put the first stage on the side of it. And so we have methane oxygen boosters on the side. And we'll take those off. It goes with four of these boosters at a time. You'll note how they are placed. They're not placed in four-way symmetry. And there's a reason for that too that uh, relates to later plans. But then we have these engines. These are not RS-68s, but there are five of them, which if this was an Ares-5, there would be five RS-68s at the bottom. Instead, they are the largest gas generator hydrolox engines that I could muster. 
that I could actually fit on, on the bottom of this tank safely. And uh, let's bring out an RS-68 if I have one and compare. They have a, about the same thrust as, well, no, they have a little bit more thrust than the RS-68. And that's because uh, they, have, they have the same chamber pressure, but they're a little bit bigger physically. And here's an RS-68. Let's take a look at the RS-68 without its, uh, I'm going to put one here. And we're going to have uh, no mount. And then we got to put this engine here. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to clear the shroud. Okay, so you can see it's a little bit bigger. The chamber is bigger, and the but the, there is there is an important difference. It doesn't have these stupid pipes going off the side. I know what they are, <laughs> and uh, but I just hate them. And worse about the R68A, and we're going to uh, talk about the R68A, is it's got a horrible thrust to weight ratio. Its thrust to weight ratio is 47.44, which is practically the worst I've ever seen, especially for a sea level, large sea level engine. The thrust weight ratio of the ED6, which is what this is, it's shiny, not very detailed, I know, but I modeled it after the Volcane 2. And so I took a look at the picture of Volcane 2 and sort of modeled it after that. And um, it's got a thrust weight ratio of 70.66. The thrust of the RS-68A is 3,137 kilonewtons in vacuum. The ED-6 has 3,924. The mass of the RS-68 is 6.74 tons, and the ED-6 is 5.66 tons. Now, how does that compare with other engines? So this is 47 thrust weight ratio, this is 70 thrust weight ratio. Volcane 2 is 76. The M1 was supposed to be 75 thrust weight ratio. Um, the LE-7 used on the Japanese H-2B rocket is 64, and the J-2X is 54. The reason why the J-2X is 54 is because of its huge nozzle, because it's a vacuum engine. And actually we have a vacuum variant. Unlike the Ares rocket, which had the J-2X on top, I decided that I wanted a large second stage, and we were going to use this engine again just with a vacuum nozzle. And so I created the gargantuan vacuum version of it, as you can see. Now, the vacuum version has a pretty poor thrust weight ratio. It's only 57. And so, and it's much heavier, obviously. It's heavier than the RS-68. So these are two engines for this rocket. Five of these on the first stage, one of these on the second stage and it pretty much takes up all the space. I didn't go with a retractable nozzle this time. Um, I just decided that we would just go with a large inner stage. So yeah, the nozzle ratio on this engine is 180. The nozzle ratio on this is, I believe, 28. And that is a higher th nozzle ratio than the RS-68 has. And as a result, it gets a little bit more ISP. Not a whole lot more. I think it's uh, 428 to 421 or something like that. That's all in vacuum. Everything's in vacuum as far as the thrusts and ISP. Uh, this large engine has uh, 451 in vacuum. So yeah, those are our two engines and the rationale for making them, well, it, it was mainly the sea level one so it doesn't have those things sticking out and we can cluster them properly. Basically that's the idea. and. I never liked the RS-68 anyway. I, yeah, it's uh, again the thrust weight ratio. The efficiency of it is just poor. So, anyway, we've got five of these guys at the bottom, and we've got the rocket. Uh, the first stage burns for uh, not 15. <laughs> it is actually a fairly short first stage considering its hydrolocks. It's only three minutes and. 11.8 seconds, and that's because it's sized to uh, basically SLS, but we've got much more powerful engines. SLS has four RS-25s. This is five very large engines by comparison, so it runs out of gas quicker, but you'll notice that it's capable of launching without the boosters, so that's an interesting side thing. Uh, this is the large inner stage, and its mass is 5.22, and based on the real, uh, well not the real, but I used the procedural fairing to get the mass 
And it also jives with uh, my calculations. I calculated the surface area and did the thing that you normally do in the rocket science series. So I got my own number and it was about the same as the procedural fairing number, so I went with it. Um, the tank mass for this was just straight up the procedural tank cryogenic mass. So I made a procedural cryogenic tank of the same size and that was the mass of it. So it should be considered legit. So in here, in this large fairing, we have the large engine. I put little thrusters on the upper stage this time and they are actually the ED3 engine, which is the vernier thrusters on the, um, on the service module that we have for the Lynx. And they're also the thrusters on the Shinkansen space plane. Oh, I guess I might as well go through the engines that we've designed specifically. The ED1 is the lander engine. That's that one. The ED2 is actually the RCS blocks. And they come in uh, two flavors. They're... Uh, this flavor, which is also on the service module for the Lynx and also on the lander stage, and the conformal one, which is exactly like that except for something covering it. So those are methane oxygen engines, and then the vernier thrusters, the ED3. Again, exactly the same as these thrusters, the same model. And the problem with these thrusters is they're actually, I accidentally put them such that they're going through the center of mass. So I would like to sort of add, I'll have to do this when we launch, obviously I'm not going to launch this version since I pulled it apart, but I probably need to do this sort of thing just so that we can have more control and, you know, rotate properly. Anyway, uh, the ED4 you're familiar with, it's the first stage engine for the Sajita rocket, and then the ED4V is the vacuum version of that with the long nozzle. The ED-5, we haven't seen very much of, but um, their thruster packs, their smaller gas generator methane oxygen engines meant to, uh, possibly for a launch escape system, but also for cushioning the landing on Mars for various things. Oh, they were also included on the Sky Crane. And then finally, we're on the ED-6, which is the engine that is on this Kasei rocket. So. That's what we've got. The thrusters on here need methane, so that's why this tank has methane with the oxygen, because otherwise the RCS won't work. And ultimately, it's got refuelers. And so we're going to try and send our xenon gas and methane over to our Mars transfer vehicle to refuel it. And that's another ED4V right there. And again, the thrusters. So yeah, that is the plan for the use of this rocket. But first, I would like to talk about some of the special features that I wanted to incorporate down the road. The version of the Kasei rocket that we've seen so far is called the Kasei Clean. And that means that it doesn't have some of the interesting aspects to it that I originally intended for this rocket. The reason why the boosters are placed as they are is because what I wanted to do was have a flyback booster. and. I was going to use retractable lifting surface. So these wings are configured with retractable lifting surface. Uh, I didn't really make the hinge in detail. But the wings look sort of good. The problem is the control surfaces on the wings. I was trying to use retractable lifting surface in the hope that I could still use ailerons on it because the only time I've seen retractable lifting surface used is on stock, black stock extensions and those seem to have controls that worked. Unfortunately, I haven't got the axes right, because when I press deploy, um, well, that one does that. <laughs> See, that's not the right way. And I've tried turning the axes on the control surface differently, and it still messes up. So, that's not going to work. I mean, it deploys in one axis, axis but it's not the right one. So I'm going to have to figure that out. And then, of course, this uh, a wing like this is not sufficient. It's going to have to have some sort of vertical stabilizer uh, placed right there and then of course canards um, placed up in front now but that leaves an open hole on the top of it right I mean that's not gonna work it's not gonna be right well I fixed that you see we, we've got our Pac-Man shroud and you might have seen this before but it was normally put on the bottom of things in fact, they're on the bottom of all of the ED4 boosters. Let me pull one of those out. You may have not noticed this. 
But this is one of the little ED4 boosters that I occasionally put on the Sagita rocket. Well, it's meant to be recoverable. Um, this little ED4 booster has floats, it has parachutes, and it has the shroud at the bottom here to encapsulate the engine and protect it from the water. Yep, and so that's that booster. And we're going to use that same device enlarged to close the top of this. And it's not pretty. <laughs> I didn't say it was going to be pretty. Uh, I can't even get it. Oh, there we go. Yep, it's not pretty at all, but it's something. I, I could probably make a better one, but I'll have to put extra effort into that. For now, this is a thing. And yeah, that's but that's down the road. But we do want to recover things. And we'll need to put landing gear on, of course. Now we'll put those at the bottom of the fairings there, and of course one in front. Whether this will ever work as a fly... I wouldn't say fly back. Really, we'd have to launch like from... Uh, Boca Chica and try and land it on the Gulf Coast somewhere like New Orleans or something and that would be the best thing. It'd have to glide back. Now if it turns out that that doesn't work the reason why I wanted five engines on the bottom is I figured that that was the least I could use to allow a boost back and landing SpaceX style. So the engines do throttle down to 25% and maybe we will do a boost back version but that's probably not the preferable way to go um, yeah we'll see we will see so I have ideas I have notions of course there's also the possibility of just putting the Pac-Man device on the bottom and having the engine cluster separate from the rest of the rocket and just go down like a capsule with a little heat shield but might not even need a heat shield to be honest uh, because it's suborbital so yeah we will work on recovery on this but for now let's get our fuel out to our mars transfer vehicle and see how the rocket works okay so here we go as you can see the rocket is just under 2400 tons with its payload without its payload it'd be probably less than 2300 tons the payload is about 120 tons right now the capacity for the rocket is about 150 tons, and that's with the winged configuration, which is heavier, of course, the wing and the Pac-Man shroud on top. Um, so this configuration should be able to carry a little bit more than 150 tons. So pretty good payload capacity, but you'd expect that from Hydrolox and then liquid boosters, of course, methane and oxygen boosters instead of the solid boosters that SLS has. So anyway... A a SAS on, throttle is up, I'll handle it manually this time, and ignition, and launch, and of course the reason why we can use liquid boosters instead of solid boosters is partly because the main engines on the core are much more powerful. Of course, we could have really, really big liquid engines, uh, or, uh, you know, the F1 configuration with the Perios boosters. That would have been an option, but, of course, this is very convenient for us using the boosters on the Sagita rocket. That gimbal, though. So, if you've been wondering, you know, why I haven't made as many Mars colonization videos, it's because I was working on this, basically. It takes a little bit of time to model the engines and think about exactly how I want them to work. Uh, during live streams, before I started my uh, stock career live streams recently, I was uh, mainly trying out the Shinkansen space plane during live streams and seeing what would be necessary to refuel it in low Earth orbit once it got back down. Remember, it, it uh, uses its own engines after it's refueled uh, to get to a high orbit like where our um, Mars transfer vehicle is right now. So the Shikansen space plane can dock with a Mars transfer vehicle like that. But after it gets back down, it needs to be refueled. And that's what this is for. Now, of course, the whole point of using the space plane is to have it be reusable. So we want this to be reusable too. 
which also means eventually figuring out reusability for the cores. The easy way, if you'd like to think of it like that, is to use another Pac-Man down there uh, to encapsulate the engines and then just put parachutes and floats, right? That would make sense. Like we do with the ED4 boosters, the single engine boosters that we have used so far. But, you know, there could be other ways. The tough part is always the upper stage, because it's coming in the fastest out of everything, if you want to try and use that. So again, rather than calculating the tankage masses manually, I just used the procedural tanks, the cryogenic one, to get the dry mass. That way there's not even an appearance of, you know, maybe some cheatery on the numbers, so... Wanted to make sure that everything was good, and again, same with the inner stage. Trying to figure out how heavy the wings ought to be is a little bit tricky. They're very slender wings, though, so I think uh, they are seven tons. And then the Pac Man on top of the inner stage is uh, an additional two tons. Okay, booster set. And off they go. Sort of a more X-y sort of X, if you will. And actually we don't want the fairings going at the same time. Okay, separation and ignition of the upper stage. I had to limit the gimbling on this one, because <laughs> otherwise it'd poke through the inner stage. So, it's actually gimbal limited to 25% there. And fairing set. So, again, there's our payload, the Xenon, and then we'll see what methane and oxygen we can actually deliver. I'm not sure. I guess I can unlock them now. They probably didn't even need to be locked because this doesn't use that except for the RCS. It's a little bit tough to get a sense of scale on this, so just remember the tank is 8.4 meters across, so the nozzle down here, I've got the exact number here, uh, its uh, diameter is 7.056 meters, so basically 7 meters. And heavy, I mean, uh, there is an argument to be made that maybe just using a J2X would be a good idea in this case. There's definitely an argument, I mean, it'd be lighter and probably would get more, I mean, the ISP is about the same. So, I mean, this is actually a little bit better. It's uh, 451 compared to 448, but then the J2X has a shorter nozzle, uh, less of a nozzle ratio. This should have some juice left to help boost us up somewhat. And then the methane oxygen up here will need to do the rest. We'll see how much we can deliver. Obviously, mainly we're delivering xenon gas here, though still this would not be enough to top off the Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. Uh, it needs uh, 7.6 million units of xenon gas. This says 6.1 million. I don't know if we're going to be able to send too much methane oxygen to it looking at the numbers. Then again, we haven't extended a nozzle on this, so it's still reading its unextended ISP. Okay, and shut down to 28 by 190. Okay, can the RCS do anything? It's enabled, but again, I think it's pointing through the center of mass. I, I didn't put those extra thrusters on. Oh, that face is wrong. Gotta fix that. Yep. It doesn't seem like it can sell the fuel down, that's important, but uh, we'll need to enable the RCS up here in order to turn this right now. Okay, well we're running a little bit late, so ignition at low thrust to help turning. Okay, separation of ignition. Oh, I shouldn't have let those... Um, we're controlling from that for some reason. Nope. Oh, come on. Switch engine mode deploy. Oh, and then this reset. 
Gosh darn it, why were we controlling from that in the first place? I guess it was the way I attached things. I thought this was the root part, actually. But still, that the controller is up here, and the controller was attached to this. So I guess that's why. Okay, maybe a little bit premature on that shutdown. But we'll fix it at the mid-course adjustments, which we'll have to do anyway. So, it is on its way. Not a whole lot of methane and oxygen will be delivered, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, so I handled the mid-course adjustment with an RCS burn. Uh, that took a while. And now we're going to meet up with our target, which is fast approaching. Yep, there it is, MTV2. Okay, we are in render range of Mars Transfer Vehicle 2, and we are closing at a very sedate pace. Time to close approach 1 hour to close that 1.8 kilometers. Well, 1.6 kilometers, because the closest approach distance is 246 meters. But uh, yeah, that's mainly because our RCS thrusters are not very powerful, and I don't want to crash this thing into Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. So yeah, we'll wait. And it is 52 tons. So it's safe to say that the launcher can launch 52 tons to Mars. No problem there, because uh, the Delta V required to get to this orbit is more than the Delta V it takes to get to Mars, or lunar orbit for that matter. So yeah, this is a tough place to get to, but still uh, a good test. I mean, it's about the same. It's close enough that it's a good estimate. So we're talking about 52 tons as it is. If we had a hydrolock stage here, it'd be better. Uh, as you know, 52 tons doesn't compare that well to the 45 tons for Saturn V, but that's because Saturn V did the full translunar injection with the hydrolock stage, whereas we use quite a lot of this methylock stage in order to do it. So if we replace this with hydrolocks, we would get much better results. Um, or if we just had the 52 tons instead of having so much fuel here and use the upper stage of the Kasei rocket, uh, that would be a better arrangement, perhaps. The upper stage of the Kasei rocket has a high dry mass, especially with the huge engine. So we would like probably like a third stage on top of that uh, so that we could improve the performance. So maybe we're looking at trying to get a Methalox version of this engine. That might be a thing that uh, would help. Or just use the J2X. To be honest, at that point, we should just use the J2X. So yeah, all right, anyway, we are closing in and I'll see you again on docking. Okay, we're closing in now, it's a pretty good view. Uh, sort of wish Earth was in the mix, but still very scenic as usual, approaching the Mars transfer vehicle. So I think we'll do another refueling launch for the supply vessel and it'll basically be identical to this. Uh, it needs even more xenon gas than this does. And because it wasn't uh, topped off initially. And uh, we'll probably need another methane oxygen supply vessel, but we can hold off for that. It's still a while before the Mars transfer, 286 days. So yeah. You don't have to do everything at once, but I wouldn't mind launching. Since this is the introduction of the Kasei rocket, uh, we might as well have another launch of it. Okay, there we go. All right, well, now let's turn all that RCS off. Okay, and I've got sort of a sub-tank here that we can Expel. And there's another tank up there. That's full up. Well, to get any more fuel, well, there's the tank at the nose. Let's see how that's doing. That could use a bit more. But otherwise, the empty tanks are the tugs, so maybe we don't need to fill those up. I don't know if we can deorbit this, though, 
it'd take 1,500 meters per second. I guess we might as well try. It's empty now, except for a little bit of methane and oxygen. I don't know how much delta V it has. Let's see. A little bit of a shame to not offload that delta V as well. A thousand only. Well, I guess we'll at least push it away from the Mars transfer vehicle and get it into a very different orbit. Well, not a great orbit to leave it in, but that's where it is. Okay, next launch. Okay, here we go again. Throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And delay because, well, lots of engines. And launch. I don't know what our particle count on smokescreen is right now. 10,000, and it's using all 10,000. Of course, the discrete motion with the plume whenever I change the pitch setting will be corrected once we start using a KOS script with this. That will handle the pitch correction smoothly. Is it possible to have a Kasei Heavy or Super Heavy? Yes. Mainly because I didn't put those sort of engine fairings at the bottom of this like SLS has. So it's easier to cluster the cores. Um, is it a good idea? Probably not. Is it necessary? Probably not. But again, uh, just with the core engines alone, we had a thrust to weight ratio greater than one. And I wanted that just in case. I don't want to have to make a completely separate larger rocket if it so happens that we need some gargantuan rocket for some reason. Okay, booster set. And set. Oop, a little bit of clipping there. And fairing set. Same deal. Same deal, different target. This time the supply mission. Okay, we're gonna end up a little bit lopsided. Uh, shut down 256 by 182, and good inclination. Let me plot for our target. Okay, ignition. Okay, separation. And switch vehicles. Yeah, well, this is not the best way of doing this, but okay. I'm pretty sure I action grouped that, but maybe I lost that at some point. The nozzle extension and engine mode switch. Okay, uh, it's looking pretty good. I'll handle the mid-course adjustment with RCS again. And things should be alright. Assuming I targeted the right vessel. That's supply vessel one, yep. Alright. Okay, catch up, burn, ignition. Okay, there's the target beside us. As usual, I'll have to do a few more burns to close in. But that should be fine. Okay, so we are approaching this time with 55 tons. And that's partly because I think I improved the launch profile a little bit. That's why I was manually controlling the rocket on launch. It could still be improved more, I think. And uh, I'll work on that. But we can probably do a better job overall. I didn't change the vehicle at all, uh, so I didn't want to change the payload in order to keep the results consistent. So, yep. We will see. It probably can do better than this still. Okay, we are now approaching to dock, and it looks like I have to flip around maybe. Oh, we got the Earth in view this time. Good times. You don't get a whole lot of dockings at this particular distance away from the Earth after all. Normally you see things happen in low Earth orbit or around the moon when it's a lot smaller. This is a somewhat novel place to be conducting operations. 
Come on, little ports. You can do it. You can do it. There we go. Jeez. All right, so let us get that xenon gas in. We'll need a lot more here, but technically it can do without. It's not nearly as heavy as the Mars transfer vehicle after all, so it doesn't need a full load of xenon gas. In fact, it could have transferred to Mars and made orbit around Mars just with what it had right now. So we might not top it off after all. The methane and oxygen, though, is a better question. Reusable refuelers might be a good thing to have, too. We will have to work on that, but should we make a reusable refueler that's hydrogen and oxygen or methane and oxygen? Probably both. But it might be easier to make the methane and oxygen one just because it's denser. It'll be a smaller thing. It'll basically have to be capsule shaped. Not unlike the, the sat pack thing. Be a lot like the sat pack. So this wasn't exactly what I was intending on doing during this episode, but I think it was a good thing to have done. <laughs> um, you know, we have a new system, a mighty system. And we will see how it goes. Much more has to be done. Again, I want to create uh, tanks that can control the boil off properly. Use power in order to uh, basically reliquify the hydrogen gas. I want to just uh, get the hydrogen tank separate so that we can use it for the Nerva uh, down the road. And probably a smaller Hydrolox engine, well, maybe the J2X will be fine, but maybe a more set stage for that instead of just using procedural tanks. So I'll see. Anyway, so with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.